Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I, I also want to welcome you to what we all refer to over the years as the Pitler Program. And for over a quarter of a century, uh, Bob really put his heart and soul into the law school. And for so many years, he ran this program. And uh, we hope to continue it for many years. And we dedicate today's uh, program in Bob's memory. So for those of you who have printed out the outline, I'm sure many of you did not, but for some of you who did, I'm going to refer to some of the cases in the outline, some of the more important cases. Uh, I wanted to first make a, just a few general observations since it's been a couple of years since we got together. Uh, New York courts, as you may uh, see, are just beginning to catch up with the federal courts and our sister courts in decisions involving the internet, social media, uh, cell phones, searches of computers, um, and even search warrants directed to social media companies for emails, which I'll talk about a little later. And we're seeing new forms of technology. Cell site simulators was just a, a basis of a decision. So this is all, I think, coming now uh, to, to New York, and you can expect more and more of these decisions. Uh, the Supreme Court rendered two decisions in the last term, which I'll talk about, the uh, Utah versus Strife case, which narrows, once again, the exclusionary rule. I'll talk about that. Uh, the Birchfield versus North Dakota cases, a trio of cases dealing with the distinction between, in DWI cases, de dealing with the distinction between breath tests and blood tests. Uh, our own Court of Appeals uh, continues to write extensively about searches incident to an arrest. That seems to be the exception that they're fascinated with over the last few years. There have been an unusual number of cases dealing with the ineffective assistance of counsel dealing in suppression hearings. Uh, I may not get to those because of the time limits, but they're in the outline, and you should take note of that. And um, as a result of Judge Shinlin's uh, decision in the Southern District dealing with the stop and frisk laws of New York, two things are now happening within the police department. Uh, new officers and officers who've been in the force are being retrained on street encounters and being given some very specific instructions on people versus DeBoer. And there are some new patrol guides that have been issued, uh, that have been drafted and issued on street encounters to conform with DeBoer. And interestingly, in some of those cases, the patrol guides actually conflict with uh, one or more of our Court of Appeals cases, so I'll talk about that. With regard to the United States Supreme Court, the sudden death of Judge Scalia this year, uh, I think will have an impact on the jurisprudence, at least with respect to the Fourth Amendment. As you know, Justice Scalia was a strong opponent of the exclusionary rule, frequently joining in uh, the majority opinions that continued to chip away at the rule. Uh, Justice Scalia joined the court in 1986, and from 1990 until today, no defendant in a criminal case has, uh, has won on the issue of the scope of the exclusionary rule. Uh, before his death, the exclusionary rule seemed to be on a 5-4 path to being further narrowed and maybe even eliminated. But so what does the future hold? Well, of course, this is uh, all speculation, but the, the five justice majority that consistently voted uh, for the government is no longer in place. With Justice Scalia's passing, uh, the possibility that we will have his replacement picked by a Democratic uh, president, should that happen, and I'm not gonna go there, um, means that the Supreme Court may become a friendlier place for defendants in exclusionary rule cases. However, another uncertainty added to the mix uh, is the fate of D.C. Circuit Judge Merrick Garland, who, as you know, was nominated by the president. Uh, should he be confirmed, what possibilities lie ahead? Well, Justice Garland has rarely voted in favor of, crim of defendants in criminal cases that have appeared before his court. Uh, in ten, 10 cases, as it turns out, he's disagreed with his more liberal colleagues. In each case, he adopted the position uh, that was more favorable to the government. Uh, one of the cases uh, that I read that he wrote on, on a Fourth Amendment uh, issue was well-reasoned, follow the law. So it remains to be seen whether Judge Garland would join the more conservative or liberal bloc. But as I say, that's all speculation. We'll, we'll see. So I wanted to begin with some cases and in the area of general Fourth Amendment principles, uh, specifically probable cause uh, and the exclusionary rule. On page one of the outline, you have the Joseph case, 
uh, where the court has returned to the topic of probable cause in drug cases. And I think the decision is a good example of how the court over the years has adopted a more flexible standard in determining whether an officer has probable cause to believe someone is in possession of drugs. You may remember back in the 80s we had that McRae case from the Court of Appeals which had, uh, had this very strict standard uh, to determine whether probable cause existed. You had to look at the nature of the container. Was it a, was it a telltale sign? Was it a manila envelope, glassine envelope? That was all changed in 1990 in the Jones case where there was a more expansive definition where the court looked at and said we must look at whether there are any indicia of, of a drug transaction. And the drug, in the Joseph case, drug enforcement officers uh, had a specific target under surveillance for several months whom they believed was trafficking uh, in narcotics from his apartment. One night the officers saw the target uh, take a white plastic bag of, quote, some weight, that was how it was described in the decision, from his apartment, drive a distance uh, to a high crime area. Now the defendant approaches the target's car, engages in a very brief conversation with the target, and then removes the white bag from the trunk of the car. Based upon their experience, these drug enforcement officers concluded the defendant had removed drugs from the target's car, made the arrest, and the Court of Appeals said that under this more expansive, flexible standard of Jones, there was probable cause for the defendant's arrest. Uh, this might not have passed the McRae test back in the 80s, but it certainly passes uh, the Jones more flexible standard. With regard to the exclusionary rule, uh, we have Utah versus Strife in the outline. And as mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court continues to chip away at the exclusionary rule. It's been a quarter of a century since the defendant has been successful in the Supreme Court on an issue involving the exclusionary rule. And to limit the effect of the rule, as you know, the court has applied a number of uh, exceptions. Uh, and one of them, of course, is the attenuation doctrine under which the taint of any unlawful conduct is deemed to be dissipated. And the latest example of the attenuation doctrine being applied is Utah versus Strife. Here the police receive an anonymous tip that a particular house was being used to sell narcotics. A detective is watching the house for a week. He sees people coming in, coming out. Uh, he gets tired of waiting and he says, you know what, the next person who comes out, I'm just gonna stop because I really don't, I, I wanna find out what's going on. And he testifies, quote, I decided to ask somebody if I could find out what was going on in the house. So Mr. Strife, unf unfortunately, is the next person coming out of the house. The detective detains him. And, and what everyone concedes, the government as well, is an unlawful stop. S the detective then requests Strife's identification, relays the information to a police dispatcher, who then reports that Strife had an outstanding arrest warrant for a traffic violation. The detective arrests Strife pursuant to the arrest warrant, searches him, finds a bag of methamphetamines. A 5-3 decision ri written by Justice Thomas holds that under the doctrine of attenuation, the exclusionary rule would not be applied uh, uh, where an unlawful stop leads to the discovery of a valid arrest warrant, which leads to the arrest, which leads to a, a search incident to the arrest. They apply, uh, in this case, the three factors to determine attenuation. Uh, the first one, pr temporal proximity, was actually in, uh, something in favor of Strife's argument. Um, evidence here was discovered just minutes after the unlawful stop. This weighed in Strife's favor since attenuation is normally found when there is no substantial time between the unlawful conduct and the discovery of the evidence. However, the other two factors did not weigh in Strife's favor. The second one, one of the, these two, were the presence of intervening circumstances. Here there was the existence of and discovery of a pre-existing arrest warrant, which was, they said, a sufficient intervening circumstance to attenuate the taint of the unlawful stop. It predated the unlawful conduct and it was unconnected to the stop. Um, and the third factor that one applies in attenuation is what, if any, flagrancy on the part of the police conduct. Was the police conduct flagrant? The more flagrant, the more need to deter by excluding the evidence. But the court said at most the detective was negligent. 
uh, and he had made two good faith mistakes. What were those mistakes? Well, first, uh, he did not know long, how long Strife had been in the house, um, and he should have asked Strife first if he would speak to him instead of detaining him and seizing him and demanding identification. However, these errors were not uh, flagrant violations according to the Supreme Court decision, and they concluded, the court concluded, that the unlawful stop was sufficiently attenuated by the pre-existing arrest warrant, and that the discovery of the arrest warrant broke the causal chain between the unlawful stop and the discovery of the evidence. So we had, very th we had three justices dissenting. Justice Kagan opined that the majority's approach practically invites police officers to make illegal stops. That was not the most animated and vocal dissent. Justice uh, Sotomayor dissented uh, much more, uh, in a much more animated way uh, and saying, quote, as a result of the majority decision, we risk treating members of our communities as second-class citizens. She even gave some statistics um, uh, of the town of Ferguson, Missouri, with a population of 21,000, uh, saying that 16,000 people there had outstanding warrants. Um, but as I said, that's the, the dissent, and we have the decision. So what's the effect in New York? Well, I found only one precedent. It's in the outline, uh, Van, uh, an appellate term case, Vanderpool, where the defendant was unlawfully detained. Uh, the police discovered an arrest warrant, and the arrest warrant attenuated the illegality, and statements were suppressed. Um, I certainly don't think police officers are going to be teaching strife in the academy uh, as a tool to recover evidence, but ultimately this fact pattern, I think, will begin to find its way into suppression hearings. Um, and if this fact pattern does find its way, I think uh, defense counsel will begin to stress the factor of flagrancy of the police conduct as a way of uh, arguing uh, uh, for suppression. This is not something New York courts are familiar with uh, so much. Certainly federal courts routinely review flagrancy of police conduct, uh, whether or whether an officer has made a good faith mistake. That's not something New York courts, of course, get into. We don't adopt the, the good faith exception. So we'll see whether this uh, fact pattern uh, find its, finds its way into uh, suppression hearings. So let me move on to s uh, street encounters. Um, earlier this year at the City Bar, we had a panel on DeBoer, which as you know, um, some exciting news, it's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Um, the City Bar panel was an interesting panel. We had Ju Judge Wachler there who wrote the decision saying essentially maybe it's time to take another look at the decision. Judge Smith, Robert Smith, who as you know left the Court of Appeals, uh, a great critic of DeBoer, uh, pointed out that New York of all the states is the only state that has four levels of encounters. Most states uh, have two, some three. Uh, Commissioner Byrne of the, uh, from the police department dealing with legal affairs said that uh, it's questionable whether DeBoer can be taught to police officers. They're teaching it, but it's questionable whether they're getting through. Um, hopefully they will. Nonetheless, the Court of Appeals continues to embrace DeBoer, applying it even more, as you know, to, street, uh, to uh, VTL stops uh, in the Garcia case a few years ago. But again, the Court of Appeals, uh, the composition has changed. We have a new chief judge. We have uh, Judge Garcia also, and Judge Piggott will be retiring. So we will see as the years go forward whether they continue to embrace DeBoer uh, or whether there is something else uh, lying ahead for us. But right now, DeBoer remains the standard. So let me talk about a few cases under DeBoer in the outline. Under level one, of course, the right to approach. Uh, most of the recent cases have dealt with approaches of individuals in lobbies of uh, trespass affidavit buildings and public housing buildings and the right of the police to approach individuals standing there under various circumstances. Recently, the Court of Appeals weighed in on a level one inquiry of a TAP building and the Barksdale case, which is on, for those of you who have the outline, is on page two. The police entered a building in Manhattan that was enrolled in the TAP program, and the purpose of their entry was, entry was to conduct a vertical patrol. When they entered the building, the officers uh, observed the defendant standing in the lobby. And within a few minutes, they asked him what he was doing there. The defendant responded that he was visiting a friend. 
But upon further questioning, uh, he acknowledged that he couldn't identif identify the friend and that he did not live in that building. So the defendant was arrested for criminal trespass and incident to that arrest, a gun was found on his person. The court upheld the level one approach saying the defendant was in a tap building, there was a door, uh, the door on the, uh, to the building had a lock on it and they noted that the purpose of a vertical patrol is to find trespassers. How does one find trespassers? If not, ask them questions, ask people, are you a resident of the building? What are you here for? Um, so they upheld the approach, but it's questionable whether Barksdale is the final word by the court uh, on level one approaches in TAP buildings because the court made it clear that this approach was permissible under, quote, the facts and circumstances of the case. Now, what did they mean by that? Um, well, first, the Civil Liberties Union had filed an amicus brief in the case um, and argued that the fact that a building is designated a TAP building cannot and should not be used as a basis to believe that there is a heightened criminal activity there, thereby justifying an approach by the police. After all, they pointed out, years ago in the McIntosh case, the Court of Appeals said that a geographical area's reputation for criminal activity cannot provide a basis for a level one encounter. However, the court pointed out that, that in New York County, the DA, rather than the police department, uh, control the enrollment, controls the enrollment of TAP buildings, implying, I guess, that there's a greater likelihood that the prior history of criminal activity has been sub substantiated in New York County buildings. What about TAP buildings in the other four counties? I guess that remains to be seen, but I think uh, it, Barksdale is certainly not the last word by the court on these approaches. And there were other questions that were raised in Barksdale. What if the defendant had refused to answer the questions when the police approached? What if he had walked away? Would that have escalated the encounter? Would the police have been able to do anything further? So those clearly are not answered questions and they remain to be answered. Uh, we also have another interesting development. The, the, as I mentioned, the, the police department has issued some new patrol guide directives and one of them regards, uh, has to do with tap buildings and public housing buildings. And in the, gui the patrol guide it says, quote, the mere presence in or near a building enrolled in the TAP program or a NYCHA building does not provide a basis to approach. That's interesting because if a police officer approaches a person uh, under certain circumstances, uh, according to this patrol guide, he would be violating the patrol guide uh, even though the Court of Appeals has held that it would be permissible under the Barksdale case. So, that's an interesting dynamic. Uh, the Perez case is a, another approach in a NYCHA building. Uh, there, while conducting again a vertical patrol, officers, uh, this was a building in the Bronx, a NYCHA building in the Bronx, officers observed uh, a, an elevator door open on the seventh floor. This was a high crime area and a high crime building, prior criminal activity in the building. The defendant was wearing a black T-shirt over a yellowish tan hood, hooded sweatshirt with the hood up. The defendant takes one step out of the elevator, notices the officers, steps back into the elevator and furiously starts pushing the close button. Um, the officer says, can you hold the door? He continues to press the close button. The door closes, they don't get in, so they go up one flight, he's not there. They go up another flight, they see him on the ninth floor they approach him, ask him if he lives in the building. He doesn't respond. He face, turns and faces a wall with his head down and the hood over his head. They observe a, a bulge in his sleeve covering the right arm, which uh, he holds, it's described as being held stri uh, straight down from his body. Do you live in the building, the officer says. Do you have any weapons on you? N nothing from the defendant, he's silent. Show me your hands. Does not do that. Again, show me your hands. So the officer, the court said, was concerned for his safety. Uh, he grabs the defendant's wrist area, feels a metal object. The defendant then raises his arm uh, and uh, the officer pulls back the sweater, sees the tip of a machete. Drop the machete, the officer says. The defendant refuses. The, the officer then removes it and makes the arrest. The court said the right to approach here was justified by, number one, the building's trespass history and this, what they said was this panicked attempt 
uh, to, by the defendant to avoid contact with the officers on their attempt to enter the elevator. And they said the police action that followed was appropriate. They don't describe it as a level two common law inquiry, but I think that's what they were referring to. And the uh, conduct was justified by a number of things. The, office, the defendant's refusal to answer questions, refusal to show his hands, and the officer's concern for his safety. Uh, level three, uh, we have this interesting, I'm sorry, level two, level two, the common law inquiry. Uh, we have this interesting case, the Nani case, 3-2 decision by the appellate division, which has gone up, leave has been granted. Uh, this takes place at 9.30 in the morning on the Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, it takes place in a private country club in the Bronx. I wasn't aware that there were any private, and the interesting thing is that the country club's name is the Westchester Country Club. <laughs> so this is the Westchester Country Club in Bronx County on Martin Luther King holiday. The officers uh, get a radio run of a burglary in progress at the uh, private country club. Five minutes later they arrive and they observe two men on the club's private driveway walking off the driveway holding some bags, carrying some bags. No one else is visible in, in the vicinity. The issue which divided the majority here uh, from the minority, uh, as w what level was present? Was it a level one or a level two? Do the officers have just a right to approach or do they have a right to conduct a common law inquiry? The majority found that there was a founded suspicion of criminal activity which justified the, the level two. The minority said this was only a level one. Um, and the, as part of the level two inquiry, the majority said the officers could require that the defendants stop for a moment so that they could be asked a question. The first defendant ran, the second defendant uh, made uh, what was called a hurried and evasive uh, departure. The majority said that this flight then elevated the encounter to level three, uh, giving that there was reasonable suspicion. They chased the individuals, caught up with them. One defendant had a knife protruding from a bag which actually cut the officer's hand. A second a defendant had a sledgehammer visible in the bag. They, th they then detained these individuals under the right to stop they go back to the club house, wh whatever that building is called, um, and determine that the defendants had gone into that uh, building, uh, pulled out knives, threatened the caretaker, took, took $3,000 in cash, and tied up the caretaker. So this will go up, be argued in the Court of Appeals as to which level of De Boer was appropriate. The majority, as I said, finding uh, this to be a valid uh, common law inquiry. Also with regard to common law inquiry, uh, the uh, cases from the appellate divisions continue to underscore the principle that during a lawful common law uh, inquiry, police officers can take precautionary measures that do not go as far as a frisk, which would only be possible under level uh, three, um, but which are taken for the purposes of the officer's safety. So I've listed a number of them in the outline. Uh, the Cabrera case, uh, Questions like, do you have anything that would be a concern to me, permissible under level two? Uh, the um, matter of Sharif case, take your hands out of your pockets, certainly permissible under level two. The Abdul Mateen case, grabbing an, or an individual's hands when the defendant has his back to the officers, refuses to show his hands, permissible under level two. Are there limits? Yes. Uh, the, the cases do draw a line and the matter of Shakir J in the outline on page three says the court distinguished certain actions by the police which are purely self-protective from those which the court views as overly intrusive such as open your coat or raise your shirt. Those actions would be overly intrusive under a common law inquiry. Um, level three, the right to stop. The Thompson case on page four this was a case the first department decided involving a group of men walking on the street in the middle of August and officers responded here to the report of a gunpoint robbery involving three black men. There was a detailed description of their clothing. They were running from the uh, Taft housing project in Manhattan to the Johnson housing project and about 10 minutes later they observed the defendant uh, the police observed the defendant and three black males emerge from the Johnson housing project. 
which was two blocks away from where the robbery occurred. Now, the clothing worn by the defendant and this group of men did not match the clothing described in the information given about the robbery. The officer directed, though, the four men to stop and stand against the fence and ask them for their identification. One man fled from the group. The officers frisked all the remaining three men. They found nothing. Uh, the officers then had them wait for the victim of the robbery to arrive for a show up, which is uh, normal police procedure. And while they were waiting, one of the officers observed the defendant place his right hand in his waistband in his back, quote, as if, the officer said, testified as if he were throwing drugs or something. A second officer saw a bulge in the defendant's waistband under his shirt in front of his pants and saw the defendant make some movements towards his back and waist area. So the officer then lifts up the defendant's shirt and observes a gun in the waistband, makes the arrest, uh, and the case then goes to the appellate division, which reverses the suppression court and suppresses the gun, holding that the police certainly were permitted, obviously under level one, to conduct a level one enc encounter. Uh, they, the, the defendant and these individuals were in an area where, where the robbery had occurred a few minutes earlier. However, once the encounter was completed, that the identifications were shown, uh, they answered some questions, the police were not justified in holding them or detaining them any longer. The uh, people uh, had argued that the flight of one of the individuals in the group uh, um, had indicated a consciousness of guilt, but the court said the fact that one of the members of the group had fled could not demonstrate a consciousness of guilt uh, of the group that remained. And there were no other factors, the court said, that suggested any criminal activity. The clothing, as I mentioned, did not match. Nothing unique about four men walking on a, in the middle of the summer, on, uh, late at night, uh, walking from one building to another. The officers, they, the officers lifting of the shirt was not justified. Uh, and because the men, therefore, were unlawfully detained, the police should not have had the opportunity to notice the bulge in the defendant's waistband. Okay, so I think that's enough of uh, street encounters. Uh, with regard to arrests, I just put in the outline a, a case that actually Judge Dwyer uh, decided, he'll be here in a, hopefully in a, in a bit, um, in the Mendoza case. Judge Dwyer surveyed the cases in the area of Peyton uh, and determined that no one had really gotten around to determining what the definition of threshold is which is certainly important that the police cross the threshold without a warrant, even though they have probable cause. So he defined what a threshold is, and the area between the two jo door jams, uh, which is really a matter of inches. So um, uh, we thank Judge Wire for that piece of information. <laughs> and I'll thank him when he gets here. Right. There's an interesting case about Peyton coming out of the Second Circuit, uh, the Allen case, where the Second Circuit decided to look at Peyton a little differently than our state judges have looked at it. As you know, state courts will look at the question of whether the officers have crossed the threshold in order to make uh, what might be an unlawful arrest if they have no warrant. The Second Circuit said that, in the Allen case, that Peyton can be violated even if the police have not crossed the threshold by conducting what they defined as, quote, an across the threshold arrest. Uh, here, the police placed the defendant under arrest while the officers were actually standing outside the apartment. The defendant is standing inside the apartment and he has opened the door. Once they said, the police tell the defendant, they're outside, he's inside, they say to him, you are under arrest. Um, Peyton under Allen has been violated because the police have, have, the police have asserted their power over the defendant while he is inside the apartment without a warrant. And they then crossed the threshold uh, and took custody of the defendant. But what's even more interesting is that if the police had said, under the Allen case, uh, if the police had said, come out into the hallway so that we can now place you into custody, Peyton would still have been violated because the initial uh, arrest was made by the officers affecting the arrest standing outside while the defendant is inside. So, I mean, consent is still an exception to Peyton. Uh, if the police th in that case had asked the defendant to come outside cross into the hallway without mentioning why they were there and then had made the arrest uh, and it was a valid consent, 
uh, Peyton, in my opinion, would not have been violated, but those, as I say, were not the facts in Allen. All right, so let's now move along to search warrants and the exceptions for the requirement for a search warrant. And as I mentioned, the Supreme Court heard a trio of cases involving drunk driving charges to determine what requirements there are for search warrants, if any, before asking to take either breath or blood tests. So we have this trio of cases, uh, Birchfield versus North Dakota. Uh, these are, I think, on page five of the outline, Birchfield versus North Dakota, Bernard versus Minnesota, and Baylund versus Levi. In Birchfield, the defendant refused to take a warrantless blood test, and he was convicted of a misdemeanor. In Bernard, he, the defendant refused to take a warrantless breath test, and he was convicted of a misdemeanor. And in Minnesota, for repeat offenders, there is a mandatory minimum of three years in jail and a fine of, ready, $14,000. So maybe New York is not as bad as we thought. <laughs> and in Balin versus Levi, uh, the defendant agreed to have his blood taken without a warrant. The Supreme Court distinguished the, between breath tests and blood tests, finding that breath tests do not implicate significant privacy concerns. They're no more intrusive than collecting a DNA sample, and they're not likely to cause embarrassment. Blood tests, on the other hand, require piercing the skin. They're more intrusive than breath tests. They can ex extract more information than just uh, blood alcohol levels. So the conclusion that they came to was that fourth, the Fourth Amendment permits warrantless breath tests incident to an arrest for drunk driving. But the Fourth Amendment does require a search warrant before extracting blood incident to an arrest for drunk driving. And that a defendant can be criminally charged for refusing to take, uh, rather the defendant cannot be uh, criminally charged for refusing to take a blood test uh, without a warrant. However, a defendant can be, under this decision, can be criminally charged for refusing to take a warrantless breath test after an arrest for drunk driving. The defendant has no right to refuse. 38 states, including New York, do not currently have laws criminalizing a refusal. That may change. I'm sure when the legislature convenes in January, someone will introduce a bill criminalizing uh, the refusal to take a breath test. Uh, it's interesting for those of you who read some of these decisions and DWI, in Nassau and Suffolk County, uh, for a number of years, prosecutors have routinely been charging defendants criminally for refusing to take breath tests. Um, and when they've gone up to the appellate term, the appellate term says the following, we continue to remind the prosecutors that there is no crime for refusing to take a breath test, and they dismissed the case. Now, what about search warrants served on social uh, media uh, services? Well, we have this interesting case that will be uh, argued before the New York Court of Appeals, probably, um, well, probably the beginning of next year now. So on page six of the uh, outline, it's, the caption is, 381 search warrants directed to Facebook versus New York County T DA. And the first department held that a social media service, which is an online repository of data, has no right uh, on behalf of one of its clients to challenge a search warrant served upon it before the execution of the warrant. There's no constitutional right and there is no statutory right. And it's a good case to read for those of you who want to review the provisions of the Federal Stored Communications Act. Uh, it goes over the various uh, tiers or levels in that act, which govern the disclosure of uh, third-party information held by Internet service providers. The more intrusive the information, the more difficult it is under the act to get that information. So we start off with a subpoena, uh, which can be used to obtain subscriber information. Uh, the, the subscriber's name, address, etc. Then an order, a court order, going up the ladder, a court order can be issued for those who want to obtain transaction data. When did an individual access uh, his account? And the third 
the highest level, of course, is a search warrant which must be obtained or to uh, find out the content of any stored communications. So in this case, the prosecutor was requesting the content of uh, stored information on a number of accounts. Thus, a search warrant was required, and they obtained a number of uh, 381 search warrants. Facebook then tried to attack the search warrant, claiming that it was merely a subpoena, which it was not, and that all they were trying to do was trying to quash a subpoena. The court said, no, Facebook had no right to challenge this search warrant prior to its execution, even, they said, if Facebook had standing, which they did not decide, which I am sure the Court of Appeals will take up when they hear this case, whether Facebook uh, had standing to make this challenge to begin with. Now, exceptions to the uh, requirement for a search warrant, and we come to one that's been um, uh, holding, fa the Court of Appeals is fascinated by searches incident to an arrest. They've decided a number of these cases over the last few years. Two years ago, they decided the Jimenez case and the Reed case, uh, and there was a, in, those, in the Jimenez case, actually, there was a very strong reminder for prosecutors that they must be, and the court used the word robust, a robust evidentiary showing that there are exigent circumstances that justify a search incident to an arrest. Just to go over it a bit, uh, prosecu the prosecution must satisfy two requirements. The search incident to an arrest may not be separated in time or place from the arrest, and there must be the presence of exigent circumstances, either establishing that there's a concern for the safety of the officer uh, or the protection of evidence, uh, meaning the destruction or concealment of evidence is in danger. And since the Jimenez case, a number of lower courts have been applying the Jimenez standard. Uh, uh, in the outline, there are a number of them. Uh, on page seven, we have the Morales case, where the defendant was arrested inside a restaurant for larceny. He was subdued, he was handcuffed, he was placed in the back of a police car. The def as it turns out, the defendant's jacket had fallen off during the struggle. Uh, it was resting on the trunk of the police car. Uh, while the defendant was in the squad car, while he was handcuffed, the officer goes out and searched the jacket and found a quantity of drugs. Uh, the court in Morales said that the defendant could not possibly have reached for the jacket. The people, therefore, had not offered any exigent circumstances that would have uh, justified the search incident to an arrest, therefore the drugs were suppressed. In the Alvarado case, um, the defendant was stopped on a street on reasonable suspicion, uh, and the reasonable suspicion was that he had been involved in a shooting, and uh, he was wearing a backpack, and as it turns out, there was blood on his, on his shirt, on his pants, and on his hands. And once the defendant was placed in handcuffs pursuant to the stop, he started crying and saying, there's a gun in my bag. The officer had put the, the, the bag on the hood of the nearby car. The search incident to the uh, arrest was found to be valid because the court said here the people did establish exigent circumstances uh, indicating the presence of a weapon. Um, the Court of Appeals has come around full circle in a case matter of Kenneth S. on page 7. Uh, after detaining, the, in, in this, this case, after detaining the defendant, whom the police reasonably believed was a truant, the police were putting the defendant uh, into a police car and his book bag made this metallic sound as it hit the car. They also knew that, the knew that this particular defendant had been arrested before for a number of robberies. They patted the outside of the bag and felt a distinctive shape of a pistol. Uh, they felt the trigger guard uh, and other parts of the gun. They then arrested the defendant and placed him in the police car and handcuffed him. Once in the vehicle, an officer opened and searched the backpack and found an air pistol. The court here said that the police here did make a, a sufficient showing of exigent circumstances. As it turns out, there was no partition in the back of the vehicle. The officer who searched the bag uh, was seated next to the defendant. Again, the police knew the defendant had previously been arrested mm -hmm. for a number of robbers, robberies. Uh, and when he was arrested, he started to walk away while being handcuffed. And all of those, under a totality of the circumstances, uh, supplied a legitimate concern that the defendant might gain possession of another weapon. 
Um, appellate courts continue to take these cases. Some are also continuing to suppress because there are no exigent circumstances. Uh, not in the outline, there was a case October 5th, People versus Houston coming out of the second department where again, the people did not make a sufficient showing of exigent circumstances. That can be found, at, uh, the, the site is 2016, New York slip op 06510. That's people versus Houston. Uh, exceptions, another exception to the Fourth Amendment, are those involving exigent circumstances. Of course, one of those exigent circumstances is the emergency exception. Um, not in the outline, but very recently on October 10th, a town justice in Monroe County, in a case People versus Roundtree, held that the emergency doctrine uh, applies when the life that law enforcement officers are attempting to protect, protect is that of an animal rather than of a human being. Uh, the court upheld evidence gathered by a humane society, and by the way, Roundtree is at 2016 New York slip 26333, it was decided on October 10th. So the court upheld evidence gathered by a humane society investigator against the defendant for not providing drinking water for his dog Coco, uh, whom he left tethered outside uh, his home in the dead of winter. The court said that the, the town justice now interpreting the Court of Appeals decision said that the court in the past had defined the emergency doctrine uh, as applying to the protection of, quote, life without differentiating between humans and animals. Uh, now, this was not the first time, by the way, that a court has applied the doctrine to animals. Sixteen years ago, it was a case, People versus Rogers, coming out of the appellate term. But there, the court looked at it a little differently, but came, came to the same conclusion. There, the court viewed cr uh, animals as, quote, property, which can be protected under the doctrine if there is a substan substantial threat of immediate danger to the property. Uh, considering that the appellate term has come to the same conclusion, I think the decision by the town judge did not give me pause. <laughs> that was for Bob, wherever he is. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. All right, so let's talk about the plain view doctrine. Uh, the Court of Appeals says, this is a, the Sanders case on page 9, where the Court of Appeals has revisited the Plain View Doctrine in the context of the hospital-patient uh, relationship. Uh, in Sanders, the defendant walks into the Jamaica Hospital uh, for treatment for a gunshot wound. Uh, the hospital personnel, as they are required to report the gunshot to the police. The police respond, assume the defendant he was not a defendant then, they assumed this individual was a victim. Uh, they spoke to the defendant um, uh, who was wearing hospital clothing. He tells them that his clothing had been taken from him uh, and as it turns out, the clo his clothes were in a plain, uh, rather in a clear plastic bag that was in a trauma room near where the defendant was um, in the hospital. So the officers go to the bag seize the bag and inspect the contents of the bag, which were jeans, uh, boxer shorts, and a s sneakers. They voucher the clothing and then ultimately conclude that from looking at the clothes that the defendant had accidentally shot himself and then they arrest the defendant for possession of a weapon. The defendant moves to suppress the clothing uh, as having been the subject of, of an unlawful seizure. The people argued that the seizure was proper under the Plain View Doctrine. The Court of Appeals disagreed, saying that the seizure was unlawful because it violated the Plain View Doctrine. They reviewed the requirements of the Plain View Doctrine that the police may uh, or must be lawfully in position from which they make their observation. They must have lawful access to the object. And most importantly, for this case, the object's incriminating nature must be immediately apparent. Uh, that's the, the factor that was violated here. The court said the evidence did not establish that the police could tell from the exit and entry wounds on the defendant's body that there was probable cause to believe that the clothing incriminated the defendant in any way. Therefore, there was no right to seize the bag and look at the uh, clothing. Automobiles, let's, let's move to automobiles, and we have a case coming from the United States Supreme Court, I think it's 
page 13, Rodriguez versus the United States, where the Supreme Court defined the parameters of traffic stops and set boundaries on what police officers may and may not do dur during these very benign, detail type of stop, stops. So in Rodriguez, a police officer observed a driver veer off a highway for a very few seconds and then jerk back onto the road. After the pulling the car over, the officer then inspects the driver's license, registration, insurance card. He completes a records check. There are no warrants. He then issues a written warning to the defendant and gives all the written work back to the defendant. Despite the completion of all this paperwork, the officer then asks the driver for permission to have his canine drug detector walk around the defendant's car. At that point, the dog alerts to the presence of drugs in the car. A search of the vehicle reveals a quantity or a large bag of methamphetamines. And now a total of about seven or eight minutes elapsed from the written warning that was issued until, until the dog alerted to the presence of drugs. So the issue for the Supreme Court was whether the police may extend an otherwise completed traffic stop absent reasonable suspicion in order to conduct a dog sniff. And th that's the term the court used, a dog sniff. And the answer is they may not. The court began its analysis by defining the purpose or what they said was a mission of a traffic stop. That is ensuring that vehicles on the road are operated safely and reasonably. And it's strange the court got around to uh, stating the definition, it, interestingly, it had never really affirmatively stated before, except in some dicta in, a, in an old case, what the purpose of a traffic stop was. It's only been a couple of hundred years, but they've gotten around uh, to doing that. Of course, they didn't have cars in 1700, but in, the, in any event, the court distinguished traffic stops from dog sniffs, holding that dog sniffs are measures aimed at, de at detecting evidence of a crime and are not part of an officer's mission uh, in conducting a routine traffic stop. And the authority for the traffic stop uh, ends when the tasks tied to the traffic infraction are or reasonably should have been completed. And a traffic stop, they said, prolonged beyond the completion of its mission is, in fact, unlawful. And if a tra they said if a dog sniff prolongs the traffic stop even a second beyond the completion of the traffic stop, the dog sniff will be, in fact, unlawful as it was in this case. Uh, there are a couple of cases involving traffic stops that are not in the outline, but I thought I should mention that. Um, first, uh, as you may recall, a number of years ago, a few years ago, the Court of Appeals in Garcia extended the DeBoer uh, s levels to traffic stops. Uh, and we have this case, People versus Cargoes, K-A-R-G-O-Z, uh, October 19th from the Second Department. The slip opinion is 06842, where the second department held that should a police officer approach a car under a valid level one approach uh, and asks for license, registration, and insurance card, that is permissible under level one as it is requesting documents pertaining to the driver's identity and lawful operation of the vehicle. And also, as you know, automobile stops can be made uh, based on the receipt of a cell phone call, a 911 call. And in the past, 911 calls have provided reasonable suspicion to justify an automobile stop if there is sufficient indicia of reliability. So we have this case, uh, Arias, People versus Arias, A-R-I-A-S. The slip opinion is 06165, coming out of the first department on September 27th, which held that an anonymous cell phone tip can be sufficient based upon the fact that it is a, in the form of a present sense impression, which the Court of Appeals has held to be a reliable um, exception to the hearsay rule. Okay, uh, what about car stops based upon mistakes of law? What if a police officer stops a vehicle based upon a mistaken interpretation of a statute? Is the stop a valid stop? Well, the Supreme Court said yes, uh, if the mistake is a reasonable one. And we have this uh, Hine versus North Carolina on page nine, where the court said a police officer's interpretation of a statute that was clearly ambiguous. If you read the statute, it's very difficult 
to understand it. So the officer who was following the statute made a stop which apparently violated the statute, but it was a reasonable mistake for the officer to make and therefore the stop was a valid stop. Five months after the Hine case, our own Court of Appeals coincidentally took up this issue of mistake of law in a case People versus Guthrie on page nine of the outline. Uh, and there, the, our court has really changed the landscape dealing with automobile stops based upon mistakes of law. <laughs> now this took, bless you, this, this took place up in a small town in Wayne County, Newark, New York, which I never knew there was in Newark, New York, but it took place there. And in Guthrie, an officer um, stops the defendant's car after he observes it driving through a stop sign in, that's in a supermarket. Uh, without stopping. Apparently the stop sign is abuts the supermarket. She drives through the stop sign, doesn't stop. He stops her, smells alcohol on her breath, and arrests the woman for DWI. As it turns out, the stop sign was not a valid stop sign because apparently in some small towns, including Newark, New York, um, you must register each stop sign under the local municipal code. If you do not do that, the stop sign is a nullity. It has no legal consequence. You can drive through the stop sign and it is not a violation of the VTL. Uh, this sign had not been registered. Therefore, this sign was a, sign was a legal nullity. The officer didn't know that. Uh, he made the stop. So the court had to determine this case and first made a number of observations. First, it said, we don't like this uh, mistake versus uh, mistake of law versus mistake of fact uh, analysis. We think judges in the past, basically it was saying judges don't understand it, uh, I, and it di it's difficult to determine whether this in fact would have been a mistake of law or mistake of fact. We don't want judges uh, looking at these cases in, in that context. Uh, we want judges to follow the Hine versus North Carolina analysis. Was it a reasonable mistake objectively? If it was a reasonable mistake, whether it was a mistake of law or fact, we don't care. Was it in fact a reasonable mistake? Clearly this was a reasonable mistake. Uh, the uh, officer was certainly not uh, chargeable with knowledge of any particular stop sign, whether it had been registered or not. It was reasonable for him to make the stop and therefore the stop was valid and the, they did not apply any suppression. Finally, Judge Dwyer, who wrote that? Okay, well, so uh, finally, <laughs> I'm going to use long words. I think I see him walking out there. So. Okay, I th okay, I'm going to use short words because he's outside. Um, suppression hearings. Uh, we've had a very unusual number of decisions in suppression hearings dealing with credibility of officers. I put them in the outline. As you know that although a defendant has the ultimate burden um, by a preponderance of the av evidence to establish the unlawfulness of police conduct, the people in fact have a burden of going forward. It's called the burden of production. And they have to go forward with credible testimony uh, establishing the lawfulness of the police conduct, even though the defendant ultimately must bear the burden. In Kings County this year, in the space of one or two months, there were four decisions where the courts individually found that the people had not sustained uh, their burden of going forward and they suppressed evidence based upon the fact that the officer's testimony was not credible. I've listed them in the outline. I obviously can't go over them all or any of them, but, uh, but you should take a look at them. Uh, they have to do with the officers being able to make certain observations, whether, they're able to make cer whether they, were, they were credible and saying they would be able to smell marijuana coming from the inside of a vehicle, and I know that's been a very frequent scenario in suppression cases. So it's just interesting, and there was one case, not a suppression case, uh, this year where the court uh, vacated a conviction based upon a lack, the weight of the evidence, where this was an officer's trial testimony, um, and um, the appellate division, second department, found that the officer's testimony lacked credibility, and based upon the facts in that case, set the verdict aside, but what, what was, I think, compelling for the court was that in their brief, the, uh, appellate, uh, the uh, attorney argued that the, in a prior case in the second department, the same officer had done the ba basically the same thing, losing his memo book, uh, losing his file, et cetera, and th in that case it was set aside, so they had less trouble in this second case setting it aside. 
So um, I don't think we have time. For, I'll, I'll be around all day, so if you have any questions, I'll be you know, walking the halls here or something. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I thank you for your time.